to finish up the series that we've been on for a few weeks now on what parts of the New Testament apply to whom. And we've got through a whole bunch of different parts, um, parts that apply only to the apostles, parts that only apply to preachers, parts that apply to Christians that lived before 70 AD, and, and so on. And now we get down to parts of the New Testament that apply to a local church or to a local church service. And as it was the case with a lot of these other things, these things are specific to a local church or a local church service. We could maybe draw some, some principles from them for everyday life maybe or other organizations or something, but primarily these things only have to do with churches. And there are some important parts that we should learn from this because a lot of people like to take certain things in the Bible that apply only to churches and then try to apply them to other organizations that really aren't churches and apply those in, in other areas of life where they don't belong. So, for instance, um, you have epistles that are addressed to a specific local church, like the local church at Corinth, for instance, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. These were epistles, letters, that were written by the Apostle Paul to this specific church of the Corinthians, and he addressed issues in that church that were specific to that church. Now, for instance, like in 1 Corinthians 5, he addresses the issue with the fornicator that they had, and we've been through that chapter lots of times. In 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4, I will read that, he addresses the strife and division in that church. And he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men. For while one saith, I am, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye yet carnal? Are ye yet not carnal? Pardon me. So he's chastising them for their carnality, for their spiritual immaturity. They were say, I mean, it'd be like as if um, Norma says, I am of Elder Conrad Gerald, and then you say, I'm of Elder Ben Ma, and you say, I'm of Elder Chad Wagner, whatever. And did I get any, any other... Uh, any, oh, I could say I'm a Pastor Boffy, right? There you go. So, and then we're all going to start fighting and just say, well, you know, Conrad said it this way, Tim said it this way, Chad said it this way, you know. I would have been baptized by Conrad. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. I would have been, I'd be more validly a Christian if, if uh, Pastor Mott would have baptized me or yeah. whatever, you know. That's the kind of stuff that they were that they were talking about here. So this is a specific issue to this church. It doesn't necessarily apply, it doesn't mean that every church is spiritually immature. Every church is carnal, right? right? So, but we can take the principle that is taught here and realize that he's talking to a church and then realize that Paul taught the same thing in every church, right? If you look over at the next ver the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 4, 17, when he says, um, for this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So Paul's ways, he taught everywhere in every church. He taught the same thing to all the churches, not some different message for the Jews than the Gentiles and all this other foolishness that people come up with. So in that he teaches the same thing in every church, we can take the principle and say, ah, it's wrong for any church to be carnally minded. It's wrong for any church to be spiritually mature, to be pitting one minister against another or whatever. So we can, we can take from an, an instruction to a specific church and apply it to the other churches. And we can pull it up in time and apply it to us. Absolutely. This is yep. a key point. This is lifting this principle. Yes. Because, we do this all the time. Because we are substantially the same thing that they were. We are a church just like they were. The same instruction applies to us as it did to them. The only exception to that would be like the things that we talked about with the sign gifts or something that was a gift given to the church for a period of time ending in 70 AD. We can't take that and apply that to our church because that was something that was only given for that time. But anything else that's not specific to that time period, then we can apply to ourselves. And does this, and I'll just ask a question on this, does this apply to what Jesus told his disciples also? Mm -hmm. uh, in as much as we're disciples, because we tend we take principles from that. Yeah. I think we just did on Saturday, I believe. We took some principles of things Jesus says to his disciples then, and we pulled yeah. them forward to ourselves today. Mm -hmm. So there'd be a couple of exceptions to that. In, in general, yes. If he was giving them instruction as apostles, mm -hmm. 
then it might not apply to us as, as normal Christians Absolutely. or even as pastors. So Absolutely. that would be an exception. Mm -hmm. And anything that he was giving to them that was, um, that was specific to the Jewish law of Moses that they lived under at that time. For instance, if he told them to keep the Sabbath or something like that, right, that wouldn't apply to us. Or if he yes. instructs them about dietary law or, you know, whatever. Um, so, but as long as it wasn't specific to that time period under the law of Moses, mm -hmm. and it wasn't specific to them in their office of ministry, then yes, we could say that, I, I would say just off the top of my head, that whatever was said to them would be applicable to us too. And we do that all the time, right? All the Turn time. the other cheek. All the time, absolutely. Pray for your enemies. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Even though he's yeah. saying it to them then, yes. we apply that principle to us because we're disciples because we're Christians. Yes, that's right. Thank you for that yep. clarification. Yep. So every local church should exclude commonly known sinners, 1 Corinthians 5. Um, no Christian in, in any local church should be saying that I am of some pastor, I am of another pastor or something. Mm -hmm. So that's just a couple of examples. Now, in that these epistles are addressed to local churches, problems and prohibitions that are specific to local churches cannot be applied to life in general or to other organizations. So this is, whereas we can apply things that were written to this church to us in our church, we can't apply things that were written to a church necessarily to another organization out there in the world, for instance. I'll give you some examples. For instance, a, a member of a local stamp collecting club is not forbidden to sit down and have dinner with a fornicator in his stamp collecting club. Right? He can't say, well, you know, the Bible says that with such and one know not to eat. The Bible's talking about the eating of the Lord's Supper right. in the church. Mm -hmm. It doesn't apply to stamp collecting clubs, lion's clubs, any other club that you're in, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, a member of a community Bible study or a parachurch organization is likewise not forbidden for saying that I am of so-and-so, his favorite theologian. So if you're in a meet-up Bible study and you say, well, I like... Uh, the Reverend Billy Graham. I'm of Billy Graham. I first learned the gospel from him. And he says, well, no, I'm from, I'm of John Hagee. And I'm of, uh, what's the guy's name there in South Carolina? Uh, Bob Jones or whatever. <laughs> if you want to be of, go ahead. I mean, these, these, these instructions don't apply to you anyway. You are not in a church. This is not a, a church matter. Is it wise to, to act like that? Probably not. But it's th those instructions are not given to meetup groups. Mm -hmm or Campus Crusade for Christ meetings, or anything like that, anything that's not a church. Right. The church has no authority over them that are outside its membership, mm -hmm. as it, we read there in, um, in 1 Corinthians 5.12. So it, we can't just start applying these things universally to any time a Christian meets up with other people in some other context. Paul says, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without, outside of the church? Do not ye judge them that are within. So these instructions, Paul says specifically, do not apply to people outside of the church. They're in, in, when we're talking about church discipline, these are things that are only apply in the church. Now the next area would be practices of the local church. So there are practices that are given to local churches specifically that do not apply to other areas of life. I'll give you a couple of examples. Music, for instance, and this is an important one. Local churches are given instruction concerning music in the church, and they are told to sing. First, uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians 5 and verse 19. Ephesians is written to a church. You can read Ephesians 1 and verse 1. I'll just read that first. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So saints are holy people, are another name for church members. Right church members at Ephesus. This is the church in Ephesus. And in that epistle, he says in chapter 5 and verse 19, speaking to yourselves, this is a, a, a plural thing, a collective thing, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So this is not speaking to thyself in, in a hymn or something like this is individual instruction to a Christian at home. This is, a, this is instruction to Christians in the church and they are to speak to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Just like we did when we sang a hymn the other day on Sunday and we all faced each other because it was a hymn about parting company or whatever. We are encouraging, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Just like the instruction says there. Colossians 3.16 is another one, a parallel text. 
where it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And we do. We teach and instruct and encourage each other with the hymns. Many of the hymns that we sing, some of them extol praise to God, but some of them tell us how we ought, what we ought to be doing, how we ought to be living. Um, what's the song about um, being holy? Take time to be holy. That's an admonition song to ourselves. Um, encouragement, the, the God that lived in the olden times is just the same today. Encouraging Christians to trust in God just like the Old Testament saints did and so on. This is interesting because you have both types here. In mean, Colossians it's one another that you're admonishing like you just said. In the uh, Ephesians 1 you have yourselves and that's reflexive. Yeah. Yeah. Yourself. If I say myself I'm reflexing the action back to myself. Mm -hmm. To God my, so I want yeah. him doing the God, which yeah. is one type of him, holy, 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 mm -hmm. and one yeah. I'm doing to the congregation, which yes. is like we did with the it's true. parting friendship. Yes. So forth. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. Mm -hmm. And of course, Colossians was written to a church too, Colossians 1, 2, the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. So these are church instructions here. Jesus sang hymns to God in the church. We read in Hebrews 2 and verse 12 that Jesus sang um, with his brethren in the church, and then I'll show you where he did that. Hebrews 2 and verse 12, this is fulfilling a prophecy that was spoken back in Psalm 22, 22, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ singing praises to God in the church. And we know when that happened. It was in the book of Matthew, Matthew 26 and verse 30. The night before or the night of Jesus' crucifixion, whenever he gave the disciples the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper. Uh, Matthew 26 and verse 30 says, And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And when you look through the New Testament, you're never going to find any kind of musical instruments at all in any of these instructions. So we take from this that, that New Testament churches are supposed to sing a cappella, just only singing with the voice, not using instruments. And we apply the, the argument from silence to this. Because if God says to sing, and that's all he says, then he wants you to sing. If there are other ways of doing it, and clearly there are instruments, there's instruments all through the Old Testament, David added a ton of them, and there are even instruments mentioned in the New Testament, like harps, like pipes, like uh, cymbals, and, and things like that, mm -hmm. but, but they're just mentioned as instruments. They have nothing to do, there's no instruction given whatsoever for, for them to be included in music in the New Testament. So when God is conspicuously silent on something and he says, sing, he wants you to sing. He doesn't want, to, want you to add anything else to it. And we take this, what we call the argument of silence. And one of the proofs of this would be in Hebrews chapter 7, which we will get to in this study on Melchizedek that I am going to get back to, Lord willing, on Sunday. But down there in Hebrews 7, 12 through 14, it says, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So Paul is saying here that the, the law has changed because the priesthood has changed. We know the priesthood has changed because Jesus Christ is made a priest. And yet, Moses never said anything about anybody from Judah being a priest. Moses said the Levites... The tribe of Levi shall be the priests. Now Moses didn't have to say, Levites are the priests, but you Judites are not the priests. You Reubenites are not the priests. You Issacharites are not the priests. You Danites are not the priests. He didn't have to say that. All he had to say was, Levites, you're the priest. And everybody understands, oh, that means the Levites are the priests and nobody else is. It's called the argument from silence. When God says sing, it means sing. He doesn't have to say, and by the way, don't use a guitar and don't use a... Uh, a piano, and don't use an organ, and don't use a drum set, and don't use it. He didn't have to do any, and don't do any dancing, and don't do any, don't do any. He didn't have to say, don't do anything. He had to say, sing, and that means we sing, and we don't do anything else. Mm -hmm. right. That's the argument from silence. Now, the, host, oh. the host of the Lord, uh, back when, when David 
at the ARC brought in. He had special people though playing symbols and playing something else. I don't know what at all yeah. times in there. Whenever he was moving the ark, he did. Just when he was moving it? Well, he, he instituted instruments that, I don't know about just moving it. In the Old Testament worship service, David did institute a lot of instruments that, that they did. his liberty. Well, it seems to me that, and I haven't, I've never studied this out exhaustively, but I've, from what I have gleaned from what others have studied it out and what I see, it seems like this is a case where God allowed David to do this this was not God's original plan. Because if you look back in the Law of Moses where God actually gave the instruction, Genesis to Deuteronomy, where he gave the instruction for the worship in the Old Testament, none of those instruments were there. There was two horns that were used, that were used to, for two reasons, to call the assembly together to worship and to go out to battle. Um, and that's the only thing that God ever instituted. And then when you look, and you can look in, in numerous places, it'll talk about the instruments which David uh, I don't know what the word was, in, not installed, but which David created or came up with or something like that. Over and over and over again, every time the instruments are mentioned, they are mentioned in connection with David. It appears that David did this and God allowed it because there are plenty of psalms which say, praise the Lord with the tambourine and the harp and all these things, right? And um, it, it's kind of like, I liken it to what Jesus said about the divorce laws where God suffered the divorce laws because of the hardness of their hearts. But God never, this was not God's plan. God said, one man, one woman for life, right? And then because of the hardness of their hearts, he allowed the divorce to happen. Same thing with polygamy. God never commanded polygamy. God allowed it, but it wasn't his plan. And it, it would appear to me that it was the same thing with the instruments. God never commanded them, but he allowed them for whatever reason he chose to do so. Okay, thank you. Yep. Sure. So instruction concerning music in the church doesn't apply to life in general because it's given to the churches, right? These book, what we just read there in Ephesians and Colossians, this is instruction to a church. This is not instruction to just Christians in general or life in general or any other organization. Instrument, musical instruments are perfectly acceptable outside of the church. There's, if we want to use them, we can go ahead and use them. It'd be fine if you had a Bible study group and you wanted to sing hymns and you wanted to strum a guitar along with it, you wanted to play the piano. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's That's right. not in the church. That's right. That's right. Uh, at the pastor's conference. Yeah. I, I, that's a great example, at the pastor's conference. Now the thing is, that takes place in a church building, but it's not church. No. right? Some people may consider it church. I don't consider it church. And the pastors that put it on don't consider it church. And those pastors use instruments in their singing. And they use instruments when we're at the pastor's conference and we sing hymns. I don't have a problem with it, though, because it's not church. Right. I don't look at it as church. Yep. And it's a different story if they say, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be there right. having a church service with them. I'm just not in doctrinal agreement with them. and I'm not. It's one thing to visit, but it's another thing to get together with other Christians to have a church service for that purpose. I wouldn't do that. But um, in that context, instruments are just fine. I wish they'd leave the stupid things off because it sounds a lot better without them. A lot of times they'll do a one of the lines of the hymns a cappella. It sounds so much better. And I just think, I, I, don't, I don't meddle, but I just feel like pulling somebody off to the side and saying, you see how beautiful that sounded when we just sang? Why don't we just sing? You know, get rid of all the whole, they got a whole orchestra up there of all kinds of stringed instruments. And, but anyway. Like I said, it's fine. I hear I am condemning it because my own, my own, my own opinion. I'm condemning it in my own opinion, but there's nothing wrong with it. Nothing morally wrong with it. There are plenty of things that can be done outside of church which are forbidden inside of church. For instance, women speaking. Right? Women are not allowed to speak inside the church. They're allowed to speak outside the church, obviously. And I will get to this in just a minute. Another area which would apply only to, to church but not outside of church would be communion. Paul gave the Corinthian church uh, instruction concerning on how they were to partake of the Lord's Supper. He did this in 1 Corinthians 11, 20 through 34. I'm not going to read that whole passage, but I think you're familiar with that passage. It's, it's basically one of the only passages where Paul really deals with communion in detail. That in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 16 through 21 which also talks about communion. That, that's a little bit shorter. I suppose we can read that one. 
1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 21. He says, the cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. And then he goes on to say that in verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. So he's giving this instruction on communion to the church, the church at Corinth there. He also talks in 1 Corinthians 5 about when you don't eat the Lord's Supper with sinners and how that you use withholding the Lord's Supper as a judgment against commonly known sinners in the church. That's the method in which the church does church discipline. Wait, can I ask you a hard question? And will you be angry with me forever? No. Okay, then I will ask you a hard question if you'll suffer it. Okay. Um, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. That one I love to use for why we don't keep Christmas. Uh -huh. But yeah. when I lift that principle out, I lift it out of the context of the local church and the context of communion, and mm -hmm. I hold that principle up support with other verses, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. To show a Christian should not celebrate Christmas anywhere, not just in church, right. but even outside of church. Whereas, you know, the musical instruments you can have outside of church, the women speaking you can have outside of church, yeah. but you cannot have Christmas outside of church. Yeah. Can you just say a little bit to this principle thing mm -hmm. on how that works? Yeah, so the difference with this one would be, and that's a valid principle <laughs> to use that, because he says there, um, where does he say, um, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils and not to God. Oh, the, the previous verse. Right, verse 20. Yep. So we're talking about here about a religion. This is a religious aspect. The things the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils and not to God. Yep. So Gentile religion is devil worship. Okay. So we're not talking about just the Lord's Supper. We're talking about religion, right? And here's the thing. Women, can, women speaking in and of itself is not a sin. Women speaking in church is, but women speaking is not a sin, right? That's right. Musical instruments are not a sin. Mm -hmm. In the church they are because God doesn't want them there. Mm -hmm. But idolatry is a sin. It's always a sin. Inside the church, outside of the church, in your house, wherever you are, it's always a sin. Christmas is spiritual idolatry. It's devil worship yes. and it always is whether in the house of God or That's outside right. of it. Yep. Yeah. That's adultery right. would be wrong inside the church and exactly. outside. Exactly. That's clarity. Thank you. Yep. That wasn't even a hard question. That wasn't too bad. I'm going to work on it. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. And, and, you know, I don't mind hard questions because I can always just say, I don't know. And I'll get back to you. In the business world, if you can't dazzle them with brilliance, or baffle them with BS, but not in the pulpit. <laughs> don't baffle them with BS. Just if you don't know, just you know, say you don't know. In the business world, they prefer someone who says, I don't know. I'll right. That, really do. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So communion was to be served when the church came together to eat it. So um, in 1 Corinthians 11, 33, it says, Wherefore, my brethren... When ye, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. So he's talking here, and if you look back in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, he's writing this to the church of God, which is at Corinth. So when he says ye, he doesn't mean just when, hey, when you guys get together and you want to have dinner together or something some night. He's not talking about that. He's talking about when ye, as a church, get together to eat. So the, the, the Lord's Supper is, the Lord's Supper is, uh, what's under consideration here? Anyway, where was I? Oh, yes. Um, yes, in 1 Corinthians 14, 23. Never a dull moment around here. 1 Corinthians 14, 23. He says, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place. So whenever he says, When ye come together, he's talking about the whole church coming together here. This is the people that he's writing to. So therefore, since communion is a local church ordinance, and every example of communion being partaken of in the scripture was in the local church, then communion ought to only be served in the New Testament local church. Because you don't have an example of Paul giving instruction to anybody outside of a local church taking communion. The only in fact, the only instruction you really have is in 1 Corinthians. Um, I can't really think of any, maybe just a, a reference in another place, but pretty much the only instruction that you have there is in the in First Corinthians, and of course Jesus gave the instruction in the Gospels to the 
to the, the first church, the early church, and then that was um, passed on by Paul and uh, presumably by the rest of the apostles. So this means that a communion service should not be conducted in private outside the assembly of the church, such as in a hospital or in a house or something like that. This is instruction to a church. And when he says, when ye come together, so when the church comes together, this is what you do, you eat the Lord's Supper. This is not private instruction. Um, Stephen Anderson, which some of you are aware, with, aware of, he takes a very strange position on communion. His church doesn't commune. They don't have communion. They, he, he thinks, and, and I know why he does this, and this is why one error begets another error. He thinks that communion ought to only be done in small groups, like among families at home, or if you only have, if you're, you're single, or you only have a, maybe a couple of you, you get a few families together or something. He doesn't think that, that communion is a church ordinance to be taken by the church uh, as a whole together. Just the very name communion should, should tip it off for you, common union. I mean, it, this should be something that the church all partakes of in common. Why he does this is because he doesn't understand church discipline and church membership, I don't think. So he thinks, well, how are we going to take communion? we got visitors. We don't even know who they are. We don't know if they're sinners or what their deal is, and we don't know what their doctrinal stance is. So how are we going to do this? So in one way, I kind of see what he's I see what he's doing, and if he just understood church membership and church discipline in, in closed communion, it'd be a, it wouldn't be a problem. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't understand that, so then he kind of goes in a roundabout way and just makes it up on his own, and that, that you don't want to do that. But anyway. You know what an interesting oh. thing is, and I'm sure everybody else sees this, but I just saw it recently. The body is called members. Mm -hmm. the, the body of the church is called members. Well, when you're a member of the church, you're a member. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's a core. I noticed the wording in both things that the body is referred to as members. And when you're added onto the church, of course, you're called a member of the church. Right, right. So there was, there was that yeah. issue that the body is members yep. and we're members yep. of the church. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, 1 yeah. Corinthians 12, yep. And, and it is neat because the church is called a body, the body of Christ, and a physical body has members. And we even call them that, your arm, your legs, or your members. You know, if you, you got dismembered, you lost one of your body parts, right? And the, the church being a body, the body of Christ, we're each members, just like hands and eyes and feet and toes and all those things. So, yeah. And it's interesting that you, you notice that because the guys, once again, at the Ecclesiastical Law Center years ago, they didn't like they wouldn't refer to their church having members because they thought that it was a um it sounded corporate to them like when you, you talk about like a an organization having members in it and i think it was pastor mott that actually that showed them hey th th you should call them church members the bible calls them church members there in first corinthians 12 and so uh, anyway that's a, it's a great observation it's something that preachers didn't even figure out sometimes <laughs> Um, this also means that communion should not be offered at a parachurch organization like Campus Crusade for Christ. And I use this as an example because I witnessed it before when I was in college. Um, I went to one of these, anybody ever heard of Campus Crusade for Christ? Yeah, college uh, ministry organization. And anyway, I went there one time and, and they were serving communion at this get together. And even back then I knew enough to know that this, something just wasn't right about this. And it was so bizarre that it was a pastor from some local church came in there. He was giving communion and they actually had different stations set up for different communions that you could take. Like if you were feeling happy, you could take the happy bread. And if you were feeling, I'm not, I'm not joking. If you're feeling condemned, you can take this other type of bread. And it was Are they just, like just, different types? Are they like different types? Like is one rye bread I, and one I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't remember. They could have been all the same, I don't know, and just maybe designated, you know, spiritual types of bread, or maybe they food colored them with dye or something. I don't, I don't, they I don't remember that part. Hatred, yeah. yeah, yeah, this one has arsenic in it. If you're feeling um, <laughs> deadly or something, or <laughs> if you're feeling under the wrath of God, this one's made with cayenne pepper or something, or <laughs> goofy. But. Even back then, that seemed weird to me. You know, something didn't seem right about that. And this means that individual Christians can't decide to just have communion at home by themselves or something. 
I have a family member that, that decided that this is, I don't know where they got this idea, but they had a little communion um, uh, set and a little bottle of wine in there, probably grape juice, I suppose, and some bread and I don't know what else. And they would have communion at their house together or something. That's, that's, this instruction is not given to individuals, it's given to a church. Now the church, the home church movement, they do that, don't they? Right. Yeah. But they don't have a pastor to give communion anyways, do they? No, they, they lay, most of them have just lay, lay people um, that do it. So laymen, just, you know, just ordinary guys. So they'll get together in a house. They call it a church, but it's not a church because it doesn't have the laying on of hands, which is fundamental to the... Right, yeah. Uh, one of the fundamental truths, okay. Yeah. And they'll take communion, but it's not really communion, even though they're doing it corporately because they're not a church. To right, with. because they're, yeah, exactly. So they're doing it out of church in that sense. Yeah. Because the problem's not that they're meeting in a home. The problem's that they're right. not a church. Yeah, yeah, there's a difference between a house church and a church that meets in a house. You know, a, a church can meet in a house. Yes. But a house church, as in the house church movement, uh, is not a church. Yes. Yeah. Most of, anyway, in that movement, typically they're not churches. They don't have an ordained minister, and probably who knows if they've even been baptized. Um, they so yeah, that's that's not um, this instruction is not to them. This yeah. is to real churches. And people took issue when I did that house church sermon. People took issue with me, even. People that had been on board and that, that liked our church here, they thought. And then I did that one, and they people that were involved in a house church were not happy about that. And like, oh, it's so confusing. And like, no, it's not confusing. Just I, I, I spelled it out there pretty plainly. It's Those people nothing confusing probably don't want to be in a church. Well, that's the thing. That's why it's confusing. That's why they're, yeah, I they said it's not confusing. It's just hard to accept. Yeah, you yes. don't want to be in a church. Yes. So, okay, so you've been in a house church, and now you find out the truth. Okay, go get in a real church. It's not confusing. It's like, not at all. And I don't even care. I don't know, you know, whatever. Well, they weren't the, in church anyway. They were in church. But they yeah. never came you're because not, they thought they had something You're not outside. hurting my feelings yeah. any. Yeah. Uh, women teaching and speaking is another thing that is specific to the church. Uh, women are, sp are forbidden, prohibited from speaking in church. And I'll give you a couple of verses here. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35. Let your women keep silence in the churches, see? And he's very specific there. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. See, very specific, in the church. Now here's a question. I may have asked this before. Let's see how good your memories are. Verse 34 where does it say it in the law of Moses that women are forbidden to speak in the assembly? Anybody remember where that verse is that says that? Genesis. Nope. Uh, see, you can tell she's BSing because the verse is not actually in the law. The law, where does the law say it? Argument from silence. The law only tells men that they're the ministers. They're the ones that are supposed to be conducting the service. They're the ones that do the teaching. So that's where the law says it, the argument from silence. That's, you, you have some justification? No, 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 no. Not at all. I just saw Genesis 3. That's why I mentioned it. Anyway, uh, when you say, but can we whisper in church? No. No, you shouldn't be. Oh, if someone sneezes. Wrong, no, but sneezing is not speaking. You can sneeze, no, no, but, but no it, bless you. No, some no. people do, do that. Like they say, yeah. they, you, after you sneeze, they say bless you. So right. that's forbidden too. Right, yeah. I don't make it's a like huge no deal word. about if somebody you know slips up and whispers or something like that. But yeah, technically speaking, I, I take it to be all speech. Yeah. But you can sing, so, right? I mean, yes. Obviously you can yes. sing, right? And singing, so the difference between that would be when a woman is speaking in church, she has the attention of the whole church. So the whole church is focusing on her and she's speaking, especially if she's teaching or something like that. Now, if she says, bless you, maybe spirit of the law, you know, it's not talking about saying bless you when somebody sneezes or something. But what would definitely be included in this is if at any time a woman stands up and says, hey, I've got something to say, and the whole church now is looking at her and she has the attention of the whole church and she is instructing them or teaching them or saying something, 
that should not be done. And furthermore, you could even take it, actually, let me, let, me, let me go back. You could even take it a step further than that, because look at what Paul's saying here. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. So this would be even a woman speaking and asking a question right. privately to her husband. Right. Shouldn't be speaking. Women should not be speaking in church. They should wait until church is over, ask their husband at home or ask, after the service or whatever. Because it says husbands at home. Right. Because yes. it says husbands at home. Yep. That's interesting. Yeah, because it says that, then we know we're not just talking about just publicly teaching or something, but we're talking about just speaking in church in general. They, a woman should not be speaking. How about a mother chastising a child that would be yeah. speaking then? Um... Yeah, um, that's a good, I mean, I, I'd say in general, I mean, you should try to avoid that. If, yeah, that's a tough one. If it's necessary to maintain order in the church or something like that, it, I don't know, possibly. I, I'd have to think about that. But yeah, in general, it shouldn't be done. Or if it is, you know, keep it quiet so people, nobody else can hear it or something like that, I guess. It's okay for a woman to sing then because it's not explicitly saying a woman should sing. Okay, so singing is a, a corporate thing, right? So when, when women and men, for, for one thing, the, the instruction to sing says yourself. So he's writing to the church and he says, speaking to yourselves, so all of you collectively. This is an instruction to the church collectively. Secondly, there's a difference in, in, um, in kind here because if a woman is speaking and she's the only one speaking and everybody's listening to her, then she's in command of the room. When a woman she's is whispering to her children or she is quietly chastised or whatever, she's not speaking to the room. Mm -hmm. She is keeping herself quiet, but still making herself talking to whatever. Right. And I mean, that, and that would fall under though the, the asking your husband. I mean, the same thing could be said of asking your husband questions. If, I mean, what Paul is getting at here is that women shouldn't be asking their husbands questions in church. Sure, yeah. And obviously they're probably going to be whispering if they were going to be doing that, sure. but still they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be speaking. Uh, uh, how about when uh, foot washing, a lot of times we'll say, thank you, brother, right. and mm -hmm. hug, or say, God bless you, or, right. you know, we'll embrace, mm -hmm. and we'll have some type of speech there. I mean, I don't know what the women do when they wash they each other's say. feet, but mm -hmm. don't you guys hug each other and... I mean, I, I would say just to, to be on the safe side that women shouldn't speak, period. Yeah, even during feet washing. And that's why if you'll notice, whenever we do feet washing, I always say, remember, we're in church. Mm -hmm. And I say that for a reason, and I didn't really have in mind where a woman whispering, I love you to her sister or something after she washes her feet. What I'm more talking about is I don't want it to be a free-for-all where women, everybody's talking, and so I want it to be kept a solemn thing, and yeah. And, but yes, I, I don't, I would say to keep, just to keep ourselves out of trouble, yeah, women shouldn't be speaking at all in the church service. Okay. So yeah. does that mean children shouldn't ask their parent, their, their mom's questions? Right. Yeah. And if you think about it, I don't, nobody should really be asking anybody questions in church anyway. If you just, just for practicality, let's say you're sitting there, husband and wife, and, and, Let's just say, well, anyway, if one of you asks a question, the other one has to answer, so then both of you are going to be talking. So, but let's say you ask a question. When you're asking the question, you can't hear what's being spoken when you're asking the question. When you're answering the question, you can't hear what's being spoken. So if you miss the first thing that you had the question about, now you're not only going to miss the first thing, but you're going to miss the next thing that's being said as you're talking and answering questions. So, yeah, that's just, just in general. And I mean... A man can ask a question. He can say something at church. Women are not supposed to speak to the pastor at church or speak up. But, so they're supposed to talk to their husband about it when they get home. They're not supposed to make themselves heard. Mm -hmm. But I think you're getting into the weeds when you're saying you shouldn't be whispering. I, I, don't, I don't see that. I, I don't know the case. But men don't, I don't even ask questions during church. No, but you have no, to no. think about when they do. In Bible right. studies I do, but I don't ask right. any questions during church. But even as a when man. they talk about mm. the other churches from before, it seems like they had talking in their churches. That they had groups of people around. And I don't know. I get the feeling that churches were held a little bit differently than the way they are held now. 
Well, that's a whole different topic, though. Isn't it? I mean, they have gifts. I mean, we're not going to go there. And that's what I'm saying. So I'm saying when he says women don't women don't (laughs) speak up in church, I'm I'm saying that that's. Uh, my wife's pregnant. She needs some work. <laughs> and there were, and, and I mean, well, in the church of Corinth, there was definitely a lot of talking going on yeah, because yeah. when you read 1 Corinthians 14, everybody had a tongue, everybody had an interpretation, everybody had a, and it was, it was chaos and madness. And this is uh, one of the, you know, this is, this is his instruction actually for that, that uh, you only speak one at a time and so on. Um, but yeah, especially with the, um, if they're going to ask their husband something, ask him at home. I would say that would even forbid whispering to your husband or something. Yeah, that makes sense. No. Yeah. Good for you. So. <laughs> and I, and I like to just keep things on the safe side myself. I'd rather, I mean, if I'm going to err, I'd rather err on the side of caution. And if it says women aren't supposed to speak, then I just like to take that blanket, you know, and not start making exceptions for it. And then have God say, "What the heck were you thinking? Why just, you know." So, um, okay, oh, and um, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 11. First Timothy 2, verse 11. Now, I'll give you, a, I, will, I will give you an example of a possible exception, okay? Remember, God's law is set up in a hierarchy, and Jesus taught, he healed on the Sabbath to show that, that preservation of life trumped the Sabbath commandment, right? So I'll give you an example. In uh, Excelsior Springs Church, last time I was there, one of the boys in the church was choking, or, or it appeared that he was choking. And, and the mother said, just blurted out, are you okay? Like, and it was kind of weird to hear that. But I, in that situation... If somebody's choking, I mean, if, if life is at stake here, well, then yes, she could say, hey, breathe or do this or, you know, so, but that's a very, very special circumstance, right? And that would be where, yes, the preservation of human life would trump the commandment that women can't speak in church. <laughs> I would have to reason from, if it trumps the Sabbath commandment, then it would trump that commandment as well. Anyway, First um, Timothy 2 and verse 11. It says it is a faithful saying. No, that's not what I want. For a second Timothy, First Timothy two, and verse eleven. It says let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So yeah, I take silence to be silence. So no speaking. Uh, women are forbidden to teach and have authority in the church. We just saw that in. Um, 1 Timothy 2.12. 1 Timothy 3.15 tells us that this is instruction for the church, for how things are to happen in the church. Because Paul says there, 1 Timothy 3.15, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So the instruction that Timothy is being given here is about how things are to happen in the church. So when a woman is not supposed to speak or to teach, it's in the church, right? It's not at home. It's not at other times outside of the church. And we know that Jezebel was, uh, the church there uh, was condemned for allowing this woman preacher Jezebel to teach in Revelation 2 and verse 20. It says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. This is the church at Thyatira. So they were being chastised for suffering a woman to teach. She was not supposed to do so. Now, but these commandments do not apply to life in general, and it does not mean that women can't speak or teach anywhere, right? Because remember, these instructions, 1 Corinthians is given to a church, 1 Timothy is given to a minister so that he knows how church is supposed to be run. So both of these are in the context of the church. This is obvious because women were to ask their husbands at home, which demands that they can obviously speak outside of church, right? To forbid women from speaking altogether would obviously be a punishment greater than they could bear, right? No women could 
could uh, handle not ever being able to speak. Women have uh, like 9,000 words that must come out every day, and that, that's what they have to do. So it is scientifically proven that women speak more than men do. They have a certain amount of words. I've read this before. Women are also supposed to be able to teach the younger women how to be good wives and mothers there in Titus 2, 3 through 5. So here's a great example of understanding that the commandment for women to be silent is only talking about the church because Paul, in another pastoral epistle, tells women that they are supposed to be teachers, but not in the church. 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 5. It says, the age of women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So the older women are supposed to teach the younger women. So it's not, women are not forbidden to teach altogether, they're just forbidden to teach in the church service, in the church context. In fact, they're supposed to teach other places. And a good example of what I'm talking about right now is we're, we are experiencing the very example. Because in a Bible study, women have already asked questions. I don't have a problem with women asking questions in Bible study at all. We're not in church. This is different. Bible study and church are totally different. Even though I'm teaching, and I may be teaching even in a similar manner that I do in church, it's still different. This is fundamentally a different thing. Okay, so we got a couple more things here, and then we'll be done. Next we have parts of the New Testament that apply only to a specific person that it was written to or spoken to. Now, in this case, most of these things, though they were spoken to an individual, you can make an application to any individual. Um, now, I'll give you a couple of examples. For example, um, the epistle to Philemon. It was written by Paul specifically to a man named Philemon to receive a runaway slave that had gotten away from him there. The whole, that's the whole book, the whole uh, first, or well, the only chapter in Philemon is dedicated to that. So though this epistle was written specifically to Philemon, many examples can be drawn from it and applied to our everyday life. So this is a, a good example, and I'll give you some examples of things that we can draw out of this. Um, if you go and turn to Philemon, it's between the, the book of Titus and Hebrews. A couple examples. We can learn how to win someone over by persuasion rather than by force. This is what Paul did to Philemon in verses 8 and 9. He says, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. So Paul, as an apostle, could have just said, Philemon, take him back. I'm using my authority. I'm telling you to do it. But he didn't do that. He didn't enjoin him. He besought him. He kindly, humbly, gently asked him to do it instead of demanding, commanding him to do it. And we can learn by this. This is just wise. This is wise to apply at work. It's a wise to apply in the home. Sometimes. It just depends. Sometimes you just need to tell your kids what to do. If your kids aren't stubborn morons, you can just ask them to do things. If they're going to be jerks, then you got to tell them to do things. And then you got to tell them with your rod to do things if they don't listen to your voice and so on. But it's always nicer just to start out by asking than demanding. In marriage, of course. You know, husband has the authority over his wife, but it doesn't make sense to just demand everything that you want done. Start by asking, you know, then if it's important enough, then you can demand it, I suppose. But start by asking. Paul here, he could have written uh, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People long before Dale Carnegie ever did. Because the book of Philemon should be tight, or could, I shouldn't say should be, could be titled How to Win F Friends and Influence People. It's masterful if you just read through it sometime. It's, it, Paul was, was <laughs> quite the guy uh, in knowing how to deal with people. 
Uh, we can learn here how to have mercy on a wayward servant, employee, or child who has been humbled and wants to return. This is kind of the point of the whole epistle, so we can take that lesson from it. We can also learn how to use godly manipulation to influence somebody for good. And, and I say godly manipulation because this is basically what Paul was doing here. Let me read you verses 17 through 21. And I've actually used this in the past, and it's worked. Again, I'll tell you an example in a second. Philippians 1, 17 through 21. Paul says, If thou count me therefore as a partner, receive him as myself. He's saying, hey, if you like me, you better receive this guy, right? Because if you don't receive him, you're not receiving me. So he's kind of, you know, putting that, putting some pressure on him there. If he, have, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. He owes you anything? Just charge it to me, Philemon. I'll take care of it. Now, what kind of a guy would Philemon be to send Paul a bill when he's in prison in Rome for the gospel and says, oh, by the way, Philemon took 50 bucks from me. You know, he stole some chickens on his way out. Go ahead and send me the money, Paul. Of course Philemon's not going to do that. But this was a good tactic on Paul's part. Take him back if he owes you anything. I'll pay for it, Paul says. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Finally, I'm not going to mention to you that you basically owe me your life. I'm not going to mention all the things that I've done to you and for you. I'm just going to leave those things off the table here. And just whatever he owes you, just send me the bill. I'll take care of it. I'm not going to mention, though. All I've done for you. Verse 20, Yea, brother, let me have joy in thee, in the, or of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord, having confidence in thy obedience. I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Paul says, I know you. I know what kind of a guy you are, and you're gonna, not only going to do this, you're going to go above and beyond. Now, does Philemon want to be a heel and, and write back and say, sorry, I'm not taking him back? And by the way, he owes me 200 bucks. You know, I want the check. Of course not. This is godly manipulation, basically. I wanted a brother one time to uh, do some special thing, uh, special coding on the website that I couldn't do myself. And I basically used Paul's manipulative ways. And I wrote him and, and I said that, you know, I've, I've tried to appeal to your... your um, your, your good side before, and now I'm just going to appeal to your, your carnal nature, and I'm going to offer you money. And here's what I need done, da-da-da. I'm sure you'll do more than I say. Um, since you are such a good brother, I'm not even going to mention the time that I helped you clean out that moldy basement when we were in the hazmat suits. I'm not going to go into any of that. I'm not going to talk about the time I helped you move. I'm not, I'm not even going to mention any of that stuff. It's immaterial. All the things that I've done for you, that's got nothing to do with this. I'm sure that you're going to help me out here. And you know what? It worked. Probably because we're friends and I was just kidding anyway. But uh, anyway, we can learn lessons from Paul. Okay, now let's lastly look. Just one more thing. Parts of the New Testament that apply to all men in general. Now, most people, I think, think that the Bible applies to all men in general. Most people think that all these commandments in the Bible are just written to all men, right? And if you understand that Hardly any of the Bible is written to all men. That Most of the New Testament, it's written to who it says it's written to, churches or pastors, basically, or individuals, in the case of Philemon. When you understand that, then you can start to understand, number one, I mean, that the, the, the goal of the Bible is not sending it out there to the heathen to get them into heaven. The Bible's written to people that are already going to heaven, right? So people get all mixed up in their, in their understanding of salvation because they don't even understand who the Bible is being written to. But there are parts of the Bible that are written to all men in general. Uh, the New Testament gives moral laws that all men are uh, bound to keep. For instance, laws against fornication and adultery. Look at Hebrews 13 and verse 4. Hebrews 13 and verse 4. It says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now granted, this is written to Hebrew believers. This is written to people who were assembling themselves with the church. It's written to a church. But this commandment here, this, is, this applies to all men in general. Um, and, and one of the reasons we know that is because God judged the, the heathen back in the Old Testament for sexual type sins, 
for uh, adultery, fornication, sodomy, bestiality, all those kind of things. God judged those other nations and drove them out of the land of Canaan to give Israel their land. And yet God had never given his law to them. Ten Commandments never went to them. Law of Moses never went to them. And yet God was judging them for committing those sins. So we know that these, some of these, these type of commandments here, moral commandments like this, are given to all men. Mankind in general. Or they're held accountable for them whether they're given them or not. But if they're held accountable for them, they have to be given to them, right? Mm. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. So God can't hold somebody accountable to a law that they're not under, mm. right? So these laws are universal laws. Not all of them, but the, the laws like back there in Leviticus when it talks about the incest and bestiality and, and fornication and, and um, sodomy and all those types of things, um, those are applicable to men in general. So as the Catholic Church maybe goes out and teaches that to men in general... God could be using the Catholic Church to that extent to warn them that, hey, God will judge them. Sure, absolutely, yeah. Or Freemasonry may even have mm -hmm. you know, whoever, whomever. Yep, right, Just right. Just you're reprobates, but you ought to know this. Right. You better at least keep these things because yep. the hammer's coming down. And if you do that, well, just like when, when Jonah, went, Jonah went to Nineveh and he told them that if they didn't repent, God would destroy their city. And um, how much of the gospel did they get other than they should repent of their wickedness? We don't know. It doesn't say, but... God just gets tired of wickedness, and if people will at least keep their nose clean and, and do the basics, then God will not utterly destroy their nation. Mm -hmm. But might, sometimes we might see wicked people teaching good moral things, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe Balaam had a reputation as a teacher or something and right. gave those heathens right. some things to be warned of. Who knows? Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. yep. That explains some of these gurus or whatever that have these mass followings and Maybe they have one or two things right, and they really hold fast to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's plenty. Of, I mean, I've read quotes from Buddha that were good or quotes from yeah, Confucius exactly. that were good. And you know, pretty much everybody's got some idea of some, some decent moral principles yeah, to, to keep. Yep. Well, I think, doesn't it also go to a little bit to our nature where people know instinctively that, you know, you're not supposed to go out and have sex with a horse? I mean, wouldn't you say that's part of it too, one? Well, that, I mean, people should, that, that, that would be something that man should know by nature. Yeah, people that, we're even depraved to where even we go against nature. Sodomy is the same type of thing. But yeah, those kind of things people should. Paul said, doth not nature itself teach you? You know, speaking of long hair and a woman, but he, teach, he says that nature should teach you certain things. And, so yeah. That's interesting because as society doesn't have yeah, those anyone of... teaching against sodomy now, the hammer's coming down. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the, no one's teaching against that. The churches are embracing that. Even though they were false churches, right. they were still doing this duty yep. to let people know God will judge this. Right. They're not doing that anymore. Nope. And, and yep. people don't know any better. Just look at this. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, the average, now the average person thinks it's okay. Well, I don't know about the bestiality thing, but they, they think the sodomy is just fine. Over half of them, anyway. That's what the polls show. God will judge. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you see, just a side note, that Trump said uh, no, no trannies in the military? No. No transgenders in the military, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's going to, I'm sure they're going to, RAS going to come down on him. But I thought, thank goodness, he finally did something decent. I thought that was great. He just said, oh, you know, it's, great. it's just yeah. so small. Oh, it's, oh, it's tiny. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, so... I mean, it's, you can tell we're in 2017 yeah, when we're well, celebrating, happy. we're celebrating that the U.S. military won't have transvestites in it or, or transgenders anymore. Sodomites yeah. are okay, but you yeah. can't have yeah. He revoked Obama's thing from last fall where he told the schools that they had to, um, do something with transgender students. In the bathrooms. Oh, the yeah. Oh, did they? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. He revoked that one. That, that Good. Else. Yeah, I remember that. That was. I even did a video blog about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was. Ugh. It wasn't just the school. It was the showers. It was if they went on trips uh, to a hotel, hotel or something. Kind of yeah. Just, yeah. Wow. Did, would he revoke that recently, or was that right away? Was that was. It was January. It was. Oh, right January. in the beginning. Yeah. This was just today that he did the mm. no trans transgenders in the military. And I don't know if it, I mean, he made it more of a pragmatic point. I don't know, maybe he's just sickened by it, and, and as he should be. But he said, we're, just, we're not paying for the gender reassignment surgery and all, the, all this stuff. And he's like, the military is supposed to be there to fight wars, not, not for this social engineering crap. Mm 
So we'll have to drop a layer. As we drop layers, we went. L, B, G, T. Now it's L, B, G. Like yeah. A little bit. Yeah, Just yeah. knock a letter away. And yeah. Then. That'd be all right. Yeah. Hmm. Good for him. Laws against murder, theft, lying, dishonoring parents, these would be um, laws that men in general are uh, supposed to keep. We, Jesus reiterated some of those Ten Commandments there in Matthew 19, 18 and 19. And then I'll leave you with one more. In Acts 17 and verse 30, one commandment that is universal to all men is the commandment to repent. Acts 17 in verse 30. It says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, means he closed his eyes, didn't look at it, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So this is one commandment that is to everybody. This is a universal commandment. Repent and believe the gospel. Um, a lot of people don't have the ability to do it, but everybody nonetheless is commanded to do it, is held accountable for it, yes. So that sums up and finishes the study on what parts of the New Testament apply to whom. Next week, I, I think, we're actually going to jump back into an old study that uh, we left off on a few years ago called Problem Text for Sovereign Grace. I got a, a few more. It's only going to be one or maybe two at the most. I've got uh, three, three problem texts <laughs> to cover that I've found over the last couple of years or something, and I was just jotting them down until I had enough to make a study out of them. So anyway, we will look at that, Lord willing.